Welcome back to another Masterclass video. You know, in this hobby, sometimes we come across animals that seem like they would be impossible to ever get our hands on, but with a lot of work, a lot of persistence, and even getting boots on the ground, sometimes you luck out. Today's video is about that exact situation. Let's get into it. Now today we are going to talk about Pataius carinata, a species that I am very proud of that I was able to get into this hobby. It was not easy, but I'm going to give you guys the backstory on it. So Pataius carinata is known as the greater keeled rat snake, and in Indonesia it's called king corals. Now it is truly one of the giants of the colubrid world. Males get upwards of 10 feet, females about seven to eight. They are very strong animals, yet very sleek and streamlined, but very muscular. Now these visual hunters will eat anything they can overpower. And I've tried just about every prey item that you can think of, and a good amount of my animals would eat them. Now these will eat other snakes, including each other, so pretty much everything is on the menu. Now my very first trip to Southeast Asia was in 2003. And that was the very first time that I saw this animal. I was at the Red Cross snake farm in Bangkok and they had an animal there. I was blown away. I was absolutely mesmerized. I had no idea what I was looking at except that this was a gigantic colubrid snake. Whether or not it was venomous or not, I had no idea. I managed to get the scientific name from one of the staff members. And from there on out, I was infatuated and it was a mission. So as soon as I got back to the US from that trip, I started messaging just about every big importer that I could think of. The universal reply was, I've never heard of it. A couple people said, let me get back to you on that. And of course they never did get back to me. At that point, I knew that this was going to be a very, very difficult task. That trip in 2003 was the beginning of many, many trips on my quest to become an importer. I did get animals from Thailand. I received Pataius coros, I received Pataius mucosa, even some morphs. And those basically turned out just to be the training wheels for Carinata later on down the road. Now these snakes occur across almost all of Southeast Asia from Myanmar in the north all the way down to Indonesia in the south and pretty much everywhere in between. So at some point, my importing business took me from Thailand down to Malaysia. And it was in Malaysia that I ended up at a Skinner's facility and I did find live Pataius carinata along with King Cobras that were there for skinning. And it just became apparent that that would not be a viable source to get those animals from because the animals were in very, very poor condition. They were only in holding to be culled and skinned and it was actually kind of sad but I gave up on this skinner as a source because I just knew it was not going to work out. So it was shortly thereafter that I was able to add Indonesia to my list of exporters and I did have luck and in 2012 I received my very first living breathing Pataius carinata stateside. So the national export quota for this species in Indonesia that year was 450 specimens annually. I asked my supplier if he could somehow search and find out how many animals had been exported prior to this. The computer system would only let him go back five years. So since 2007, there had been zero exported. And in 2012, my few animals were the very first ones. Now I do know that there's an importer in Colorado that was importing Pataius carinata as Pataius mucosa. Um, Somehow that person's supplier was able to get an export quota for mucosa, but not carinata. So they pulled a little bait and switch thing, which is very, very typical among a lot of suppliers. And a few kind of trickled into the US at that point. Now in 2016, the quota was reduced to 27. And as of last year, the quota was 95 for 2021. And even though those numbers sound like a lot, that does not mean that that many animals are being exported. In fact, very, very few, almost some years, none are being exported at all. And those quotas are remaining unused. Now, later, I did end up sourcing Pataius carinata from my supplier in Malaysia. And I noticed something very interesting. 
All of those Malaysian animals were very beautifully banded and they had white contrasted banding. In Indonesia, they call those animals pearl, but they're, they're mixed in along with other specimens. A lot of the specimens are just kind of dark and unappealing. But in Malaysia, for some reason, I was just getting beautiful animals every single one, 100% of the time. So it was at that point that I decided to abandon the Indonesian animals and focus 100% on the Malaysian locality, Pattaya's Carinata. So upon arrival, I would remove those big snakes from the snake bags, I would secure their heads, quickly give them a once over, I would remove any ticks, if I saw any scars or wounds, I would treat them, and those animals would go directly into their cages and be left alone. Hide boxes and different uh, cage decor would provide some security for those animals and I would put them away and that was it. No foot traffic, nothing. Just leave them alone completely for about one week. Now I learned early on that these big high energy snakes did not do well with handling, especially when they were very nervous about it, even defensive about it. It just created a lot of unnecessary stress for those animals. So handling them was definitely a no-no in the beginning. Later on, fully established and that sort of thing, yes, I would do it periodically, maybe for video or photos, but for the most part, hands off. Now I would house them all solitarily, one per cage, with a hide box, large water bowl, and some cage decor to provide some security. After about the first week of no interaction, I would start feeding trials. I would offer live rat pups to begin with. They provided some movement, the animals weren't harmful for the snakes, I could leave them in there for an extended period of time. They were just easy for me to, like a first step. A lot of animals would not eat the rat pups. From there, I would move on to frozen thawed chicks and frozen thawed quail and see how that went. If I still had animals that were refusing to feed, I would then go to frozen thawed frog legs, which I would source at the Asian market. The uh, water that you would end up with after thawing a frozen frog leg was also good for scenting. So I could go back and scent rat pups with the frog scent if need be. Now there's always some animals that would not feed at all and for those I had to feed them live Melanostictus toads. That's a native toad that comes from the region that they come from. They are not affected by the toxin from the toads at all and that was always a winner. I imported those along with my Pattaya's Carinata just in case as a backup and it almost 100% of the time worked for the stubborn feeders. So the biggest failure in this hobby is that animals come in and get reshipped like two or three times before they even leave the bags. Unfortunately, in this industry, most importers are just in it for the money. They don't have any kind of interest in the animals. They don't really care. It's just all about get them in, get them out, and move stock and make money. So for that, this species does horribly. I would see animals landing at LAX, getting transshipped to Colorado, then to Florida, then from Florida back to the Midwest. And then you would see animals at an expo. And some of these resellers would be tailing these big snakes in the middle of a busy aisle just for people's attention, right? That was so many steps backwards from acclimation and the losses were very high. It's very sad because these animals are very, very difficult to get sourced and the losses were pretty heavy just because of social media and people just trying to flip them as fast as possible. So earlier I mentioned that these snakes do eat other snakes. So I had some friends that were breeding ball pythons, corn snakes, I was breeding snakes myself. Anything that would leave the egg or was born with a kink or was stillborn or dead in the egg or whatever it may be, the Pattaya's carinata were the garbage disposals for all of those snakes. It provided a varied diet, very much like in nature, and I saw nothing wrong with it because nothing was going to waste. So determining gender was quite different. Uh, you know, in most snake species, males are going to probe to a depth of like 9 to 15 subcaudals and females maybe like 3 to 8. On average, it's different per species. These particular snakes, our females were probing at 9 to 10 subcaudals and our males at 15 to more than 20. 
Now, a trained eye is usually able to visually sex these animals, but if you don't have a lot of experience, you may want to just resort to probing just to make sure. Baby, small, and medium-sized animals were a little bit more tricky, so I recommend probing on those guys, the smaller guys. It's just a, a more sure way of determining sex. So I bred my first Carinata in 2016. I actually found that the breeding was quite simple. If you had a good male, a good breeder male, and your females of course needed to be up within condition, and if you had those, those uh, parameters set, you could get eggs. It wasn't a big deal. I got several clutches of eggs myself. So palpating for follicles was the method that I used to determine whether or not they were ready to be paired. If I felt follicles, I was putting those females with males and praying for the best outcome. I never put animals together that had no follicles. I was too afraid of a feeding response and that sort of thing. So I just waited until I had the best feeling that the females would be receptive. I didn't do any cycling, no temperature cycling or anything of that nature. When the females did have follicles present, in addition to pairing, I would start feeding them heavy. At least two meals a week, sometimes three small meals a week was something that I did. And it seemed to really get those females up to speed. And it was successful almost every single time. Now, sometimes the females would develop follicles and they would reabsorb, but most of the time not. So I would just continue introducing males in between feedings until I could tell it was a done deal. Clutches averaged seven to 12 eggs, but getting the eggs to hatch out proved quite difficult. I did manage to hatch viable babies on two occasions and I incubated these eggs at 78 degrees and it took them 90 days to hatch. So of the very few babies that I did hatch, I managed to have pretty good luck getting them established and feeding. I tried live pinkies, this worked some of the time. I did live geckos on other animals. Sometimes an animal that ate a live pinky one week wouldn't eat one the next so I had to switch it up a little bit. I even tried various food items on the end of tweezers and hemostats and that also did work. Now the babies hatch out with like a green wash to them and it does go away over time with each shed. So this is another species that I created a market for. I know they're still in huge demand because I still get two to three messages per week for them. The global demand also is there because I see even Malaysian and Indonesian hobbyists posting them on social media. Now I realize that they are a lot like us, they post for attention. So if they see people in other countries interested in a particular species, they're gonna post those animals to get the attention, to get the likes, to get the shares. Previous to me bringing them into the hobby and creating that market, they were just being skinned. Nobody cared about them in the countries that they come from. I have seen Indonesian keepers posting eggs and babies. I haven't seen any copulation pictures or video to prove that those animals are being captive bred in those countries. I suspect those are just wild caught animals that laid eggs in captivity and they hatched them. Either way, it's cool. I like to see stuff like that also myself. However, my feelings are a little bit mixed for bringing this species into the market because now I feel that there's double pressure on them. They're still being skinned, but yet now there's a pet trade demand. So again, my feelings are a little bit mixed. Um, I feel responsible for creating that demand, but I'm just hopeful that hobbyists are able to do their job and get these animals reproducing in captivity establish them in captivity that is the goal i still have my animals my big colony in malaysia we are also continuing putting in the work and trying to do the same exact thing so i hope i never see a video on youtube of patias carinata reacting to fidget spinners or jump on instagram and see a patias carinata crawling through a bowl of macaroni you have to remember for every species that's in the hobby Somebody did the work for you to have that animal. It could have been 100 years ago and that person is no longer with us. Or it could have been 10 or 15 years ago and I'm still here. So you just have to remember that. Respect your animals always. I realize that some of these videos are probably ruffling some feathers out there. There's a massive amount of competitiveness and some huge egos between importers, breeders, hobbyists, resellers, whatever it may be. 
Everybody wants to be the authority. Everybody wants to be the guy that did it first. I just wanted to provide you guys the history on Patias Carinata and my participation in it. Thank you so much for watching. Be safe and we will see you in the next one. Take care.